Okay, good evening. So my name is Avi Noam Pat. I'm the uh, Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut, where I serve as Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening for the next installment in our series, which is part of the Jewish Hartford European Roots uh, program, the Yiddish Welt, uh, celebration of Yiddish culture, or I should say a virtual celebration of Yiddish culture. Uh, this is the third in what has proven to be a very successful series of programs with remarkable uh, participation. So we're delighted to see such wonderful participation in these uh, programs. Uh, our first uh, lecture and all of these lectures are being recorded and are available on the uh, Yukon Center for Judaic Studies website. Um, our first lecture, which was with Eddie Portnoy, uh, is uh, on the website. He spoke about his book, Bad Rabbi and the Jewish Underground Press. Our second lecture was with Sam Casso, who talked about Yiddish culture and wartime. And I'm very excited for our third lecture this evening with Nick Underwood, who I will be introducing in a moment. In two weeks, we will have our fourth uh, lecture as part of this series. And the fourth uh, program will be with Mark Slobin, who will be talking about the Yiddish song or Yiddish music, which will be a perfect continuation of this series on Yiddish culture. And then after a short hiatus in August, when we'll all take a break, uh, we'll conclude these, this series with a uh, program, a very special program with Anna Sternschis and Soy Korolenko uh, on their uh, Grammy Award winning Yiddish music project uh, called Yiddish Glory. Um, so we're very excited about this program, and I'm very grateful to my colleague Estelle Kafer, uh, who suggested this uh, series on Yiddish culture as part of the Jewish Hartford European Roots program. So a couple of um, housekeeping uh, points before I introduce uh, Nick and we launch into our uh, program this evening. Um, and Nick is going to uh, lecture for about 40, 45 minutes and share uh, a PowerPoint and share his website on um, Yiddish theater. Uh, we do welcome Q&A and questions. And what I'd like to ask is if you have questions as Nick is speaking to please type those questions into the chat box. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little uh, bubble for the chat box. If you hover over it, you can click on it and open up the chat and you can send a question uh, either to uh, the host, which is me, to the presenter, to Nick, or ideally, please make sure you send the question to everyone because if you have a question, maybe everyone has the same question. And then at the end of Nick's lecture, um, I will facilitate a Q&A with Nick. Um, so we are delighted to welcome uh, Nick Underwood this evening. Uh, Nick Underwood will soon, very soon, be joining the College of Idaho as an assistant professor of history and the Berger Nielsen Chair of Judaic Studies this coming fall. Um, he recently was a research fellow at the Frankel Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan as a member of the cohort working on the theme Yiddish Matters. His work has appeared in several journals, and his first book, Yiddish Parish, Staging Nation and Community in Interwar France is forthcoming from Indiana University Press in 2022. He is starting a new book project titled Plural Jewish Communities, Yiddish Culture and Jewish Migration in Post-Holocaust France. I should also mention that Nick has a very impressive uh, administrative role. He serves as an editor for two, not just one, but two journals in Jewish studies, uh, one is East European Jewish Affairs, and the other is American Jewish History. I don't know where he finds the time to do everything that he does. Um, and he is also going to be talking to us about this amazing project that he has worked on. Uh, he's the project manager for the Digital Yiddish Theater Project. So we're delighted to welcome Nick Underwood to speak with us this evening on the world of Yiddish theater in history and digital. Welcome. Thank you, Avi. It's um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to to be here this evening, um, and it's uh, it's a real honor to be included with the other speakers with this uh, with this series. Um, and I hope that many of you have been able to see the other, the previous talks and the future talks. 
Um, I'm sure that they were all and all will be great, um, but I'm thrilled for this invitation uh, this evening. And like I said, I'm thrilled to be included in this um, lecture series. Uh, I think it's a great idea to, uh, to keep uh, this kind of content out there. And um, I'm hoping that once I get to Idaho that I might uh, be able to uh, take some of these ideas and maybe do something similar out West. Um, but I, I appreciate everyone signing in this evening and, um, and uh, we, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's start. Um, so we're gonna talk tonight about the Yiddish theater and the history of the Yiddish theater. We're also gonna talk about what's happening now, right? So the Yiddish theater is a global cultural phenomenon that dates back to the Middle Ages um, with a cult rich cultural legacy that extends well into our current moment now. Yiddish drama has, has grappled with all the major challenges the Jewish world has faced during its long time span, including tensions between tradition and modernity, Jewish and secular political movements and ideologies, changes in family structures and gender roles, as well as violence, including pogroms, wars, and genocide, and plays during and even after the Holocaust uh, directly addressed issues of fascism and anti-fascism as well. Besides being a great performance culture and just a, a joy to, to enjoy and, and watch and read and see, Yiddish theater is also a great way to understand Jewish history and culture. Today, um, uh, we're actually here now looking at a, a, the inside of a, of a theater um, uh, from Paris, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, today, we're gonna learn some about the global history of, of Yiddish theater. Um, really kind of go to its origins and bring us to the 20th century. Um, we're going to take some time specifically to look at um, a Yiddish theater troupe in the Yiddish theater scene of 1920s and 1930s Paris. Uh, as Avi uh, uh, mentioned in the uh, introduction, um, as you could probably tell, my main area of, of research and expertise is 20th century Yiddish culture in Paris. Um, and when I have done my research, I have found that um, it was in Paris, of, of all places, that became uh, somewhat of a hub of Western European interwar Yiddish um, culture and Yiddish theater. And so we're going to talk about that some today. Uh, and then we're going to look at what is uh, happening now um, in the world of scholarship and really digital humanities. It's really trying to take some of this research that I and many, many other colleagues are doing and bring it to new audiences um, by way of taking advantage of digital tools. Um, um, quite simply, uh, a website, but more, um, more ambitious kind of digital tools that we'll talk about at the end. We'll actually look at the Digital Yiddish Theater website, look at some blogs and explore some of the projects that we work on. Um, I should also make, make it clear that although we are talking about the history of Yiddish theater, this is not a historical phenomenon. This is, um, there is Yiddish theater being produced today, being written today, uh, being staged today, of course, when not in a pandemic, um, that people can uh, enjoy uh, and see. Yiddish theater and drama developed later than theatrical traditions of medieval Christian Europe, though along a similar uh, trajectory. The performative elements uh, of certain Jewish rituals would spill into secular entertainments. And other uh, Yiddish-speaking solo performers of the time, like troubadours and jesters, and magicians created songs and stories that would provide the raw material for scripted theatrical offerings, and established performance traditions that would work their way into professional Yiddish plays. In the medieval Purimspiel, uh, a, a, a play, um, a type of play that was performed historically and is still now uh, during the uh, the uh, during the holiday of Purim uh, dramatized biblical stories uh, and invented contemporary ones. Uh, the Purim spiel, however, limited by being performed almost exclusively by amateurs and and entirely by men and boys, at least historically, uh, were off uh, who were often rabbinical students. Still performed in some communities to this day, uh, the Purimspiel would serve as a major influence on the development of modern Yiddish drama. The Enlightenment, or the Haskalah, which arose initially in uh, major Central and Eastern European urban centers in the last quarter of the 18th century, helped bring about changes in Jewish life that included new ways of writing and performing Yiddish plays. Leading Haskalah figures uh, in, the, in the 1790s 
uh, wrote plays making fun of what they saw as the shortcomings of many Jewish traditions and those who followed them and urged Jews to seek greater balance between their adherence to Jewish tradition and participation in modern secular life. Plays oftentimes satirized contemporary life and specifically Jewish life as Jews were urbanizing, as Jews were moving from smaller towns to bigger uh, city centers, as Jews were engaging with different types of literatures and really rethinking how they thought they could fit into a European, uh, at that time, uh, specifically a, a European context. This would be the foundation for the next couple of generations of Yiddish playwrights who would write satires that would often be published uh, and sometimes read in literary salons, but not performed publicly during this, during this time. It would take the better part of a century for a stable professional Yiddish theater culture to be established. This change would come in 1876, when Avram Goldfaden, oops, here, oh, oh, there we go. Um, some of those slides did not, well, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, when Aaron Goldfund, who we are looking at a portrait of him on my right, prob uh, if you're looking, probably your right too, <laughs> and uh, a playbill on the left that we'll mention in just a moment. Um, in 1876, when Goldfund, who's considered the father of modern Yiddish theater, assembled a small troupe in Romania and began serving as its resident, as resident dramatist, director, and impresario. Over the next few years, Goldfund churned out a steady stream of plays. His best known works, such as the opera The Sorceress from 1879 and the satirical farce The Two Puni Lemels from 1881, became, became ubiquitous in the Yiddish speaking world. And I should also note that Goldfaden was not only specifically producing plays in Yasi in, in Romania, he was traveling throughout Europe um, trying to start uh, Yiddish, um, uh, Yiddish troops and Yiddish productions in other parts of Europe. He actually has a failed stint in Paris around the turn of the century. With the enormous demographic shifts about to reshape the global Jewish map, this would mean that Yiddish audiences and, other, and, others, in trans, and, and others in translations into uh, many other languages would experience plays by Gold, Goldfaden and later Yiddish playwrights, not just, as, not just in Eastern Europe, but across the continent, up and down the Americas, and in other centers of Jewish life, like uh, the land of Israel and Palestine, uh, Australia, South Africa, as well as other parts of Europe, as I was mentioning. As professional stage, as professional Yiddish stage expanded its geographic horizons, it evolved in other ways as well. The satires, light comedies, and operettas, this, uh, this playbill that right here that we're looking at is a playbill for um, an operetta by um, uh, Goldfaden uh, Bar Kochba, um, that dominated the repertoire early. These, these types of satires, light comedies, and operettas dominated the repertoire early on and would remain popular. <clears throat> but it took little time for artistically ambitious artists to create more accomplished works. Many playwrights, performers, and composers straddled the popular and more highbrow Yiddish stage, such as Goldfaden himself. He turned a grand opera in his masterpiece, uh, in his, uh, in his masterpiece uh, as well as uh, the, this play that we're looking at, Barkovka, and serious drama after the fate of Eastern European Jewry turned darker in the 1880s with pogroms that followed the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in the Russian Empire. His chief competitors, uh, such as jo Joseph Leitner, tended to be more associated with popular theater, um, which was derisively uh, called shund, which in, in Yiddish just literally means trash. Um, but this was a, a high moment of debate between those who were creating high art or highbrow theater and those creating shund theater. So they too often engaged in key issues of the day, the shund um, theater um, writers as well, uh, even in works that on the surface appear to be little more than escapist entertainment. Russian-born intellectual Jacob Gordon ushered in a new era of Yiddish drama shortly after emigrating to New York in 1891, a decade into a wave of mass immigration from Eastern Europe that would redraw the global Jewish map. Looking for new outlets to feed his, uh, his large and growing family, quite frankly, and admiring contemporary playwrights, 
Gordon launched a campaign to reform Yiddish drama. He wrote plays that grappled with pressing social matters like the status and treatment of women, changing family dynamics, and corruption. Gordon also played homage to classic writers with plays like the, uh, like the Jewish King Lear, which he wrote in 1892. His contemporaries and successors similarly imported plots and themes and characters found throughout the Western canon from the Greeks to the moderns uh, into numerous tragedy, tragedies, comedies, melodramas, uh, musical comedies, and operas. And that's something that we need to, 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 to note here, right? That this is a, an artistic form that is borrowing from other similar um, uh, dramatic modes around the world. So although this is a Yiddish theater um, uh, history that we're talking about, this is really the history of world or global theater, as it were, because these playwrights were very, very much in, uh, in conversation with contemporary and historic playwrights of a variety of languages. There are themes that come up in a lot of these plays that might remind us of, for example, Moliere's Tartuffe, or something like that. So to, to, it, is, it is important to keep in mind that this is a, a, an artistic mode that is deeply in conversation with other similar theatrical traditions from around the world. And at the same time, these writers invented original, distinctly Jewish stories and characters that reckoned with social changes and historical developments that span the heyday of the modern Yiddish stage in the late 1800s to the onset of World War II. In just a couple of decades, the first cohort of Yiddish playwrights established a varied and complex repertoire that later dramatists would expand. And these artists included many of the most influential Yiddish writers, many of them at least well known for their works in other genres, as well as for their plays. Such figures included the classical, as we call them, Yiddish writers, um, Abramovich, Yidlamet Peretz, and Sholom Aleichem, as well as Peretz's protégés, Sholom Ash and Dovid Pinsky, whose literary careers started at the turn of the 20th century and went on throughout it. Those writers, along with other highly regarded playwrights, such as Leon Kobrin, Shin Ansky, Han Levick, and Peretz Hirschbein, provided much of the dramatic material staged by artistically ambitious companies, prized by serious critics and theater goers around the Yiddish um, uh, theater world. And I should note too here that this Yiddish theater world uh, included non-Jewish visitors, which we'll, we'll take a look at briefly when we talk about Paris, but also know that around the world, non-Yiddish speakers, non-Jews, were attending some of these Yiddish theatrical spaces and engaging with, with Yiddish theater throughout the world. The body of work they created, these playwrights, includes the three most successful and, in, and influential Yiddish dramas. Sholem Ash's God from the Coma, or, or God of Vengeance, which was written in 1907, Shinansky's The Dibuk, Der Dibuk, from 1920, and Levick's The Golem from 1921. And all of them uh, staples of the Yiddish repertoire, translated into numerous uh, other languages, adapted countless times, and the subject of the of ongoing interest uh, to this day. There was in fact a, a play uh, that was on Broadway that was inspired um, by God of Vengeance uh, that was written by the playwright Paula Vogel called Indecent. Uh, and there was actually even a Yiddish staging of uh, God of Vengeance just a few years ago in New York as well. So these are plays that are still resonating with people who are engaging, creating, and thinking about Yiddish theater. Yiddish theater would come into full blossom between the world, two world wars. With a robust international network of artists, performers, troops, uh, playwrights, and other personnel. Their work also spawned a modest but vibrant Yiddish film industry active in centers like Moscow, Warsaw, Vienna, and New York. Much of that activity would come to an abrupt halt at the outbreak of World War II. Nevertheless, Yiddish cultural production continued during the Holocaust, almost in, often in almost impossible conditions and, it's, and, it's, and in its aftermath, in spite of the decimation of Europe's Yiddish-speaking communities. Yiddish playwrights and performers would bear witness to the attempted destruction of European Jewry and efforts to rebuild the, in the aftermath of the Holocaust in such places, in such pieces like Levick's The Miracle in the Ghetto, 
one of the first works of art of, in any language to depict the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and Kadia Molodovsky's After the Desert God, which was written in 1949. In Paris, too, after the war, um, when Yiddish culture makers and Yiddish activists come back and start to recreate their community after people are coming back from deportation, from hiding, and from the resistance, some of the first and earliest Yiddish cultural productions that they put on is Yiddish theater. Um, as early as December of 1944 in Paris, Yiddish theater comes back. This is while the Holocaust is still raging throughout Europe. Um, so the Yiddish theater uh, was a way for people to, um, at this particular moment, kind of um, declare their existence, declare their survival, and, and, and use it as a, as, a, as a piece of kind of memorial also for those that had been lost. We could talk about that after the talk if we'd we like to. I want to turn now, though, to the interwar years. And I want to specifically talk about debates that start around World War I, roughly. And this is a debate about the, the theater fraga, the theater question. And these were debates among theaters, theater thinkers, and writers um, that led to this establishment of art theaters, um, specifically the Moscow Art Theater and others. And they were trying to educate actors. Um, they were in, imposing lengthier rehearsals. Um, they were encouraged more decorous, more behaved audiences. And they were also putting more thought into the design of the, of the stagings uh, and trying to also build a more literary repertoire. And there were two approaches to this that were happening within the Yiddish uh, theater world. One was actor-based. Most famously, this was an approach that was taken up by Maurice Schwartz, who uh, ran the, uh, the Yiddish Art Theater in New York City, um, and also uh, would also focus certain theaters. So other theater productions and other theater troops would focus on a particular star, if you will. Um, Ida Kaminska was one who was really well known, and also a lot of um, this kind of uh, actor-based um, uh, productions were, were, were centered on. The other approach was troop-based and looked at more as theater as a collective um, enterprise. And here we see these, um, these, uh, these approaches really kind of come to fruition in settings such as the Soviet Union with the Moscow State Art, uh, Yiddish Art Theater, um, Artaf, which was a left-wing um, Yiddish um, uh, workers theater in New York City, as well as the Vilna Troupe, which was this collective, this transnational um, Yiddish theater troupe uh, that was based in Vilna, but rarely there. <laughs> they continuously traveled. Um, but they really brought to the fore this idea, especially in Europe, this idea that it was the troupe, it was the collective, it was the ensemble um, that was the focal point to this kind of Yiddish theater um, uh, artistic enterprise. Um, uh, Deborah Kaplan even, uh, historian Deborah, Deborah Kaplan even argues that the Vilna Troupe is almost the, the, the precursor to this idea of a Broadway play, because wherever the Yiddish theater troupe would go, they would spawn new theaters, and there would be sometimes several Yiddish, uh, uh, excuse me, Vilna Troops uh, performing uh, in a variety of cities. This mode of, cat, uh, this mode of uh, theater would catch on also in all of, in all, in of all places, Paris, not known for its Yiddish theater, but as I hope to show today, it had a scene and troupe that were both lively and important, and that placed Paris as a hub of interwar Yiddish theater. And I should also say that Paris is still one of the places in Europe where you can still see new Yiddish theater. Now, let's turn to Paris. Yiddish theater troops had passed through Paris as early as 1855. And this playbill right here attests to that. This is a playbill from a 1903 production of Daniel in the Lion's Den. And this, play, this, play, this poster and others like it um, resemble contemporaneous international counterparts much more than it does later examples of Yiddish theater in Paris, and we'll take a look at that. And notably, four of the five uh, actors featured here were from London at the time. It's not actually until after World War I that Parisian Yiddish theater would start to take on a more distinctly Parisian identity. But this is just to show that there was uh, an established uh, world, if you will, of Yiddish theater in France dating till at least the turn of the century. But like I said, this would change after World War I. During the 1920s, uh, which was during, and especially in France, a, a, a moment of, of vast uh, migration from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, uh, the Arbeiter Stimme, a communist Yiddish weekly pub, uh, newspaper that was published in Paris, tried to alleviate some of the stresses that might have come along 
with trying to navigate the overwhelming amount of cultural activity that existed in interwar Paris. Uh, in war Paris, to some extent, it was just like it is now. It is a, a overwhelming with the types of cultural um, engagement that you can have. And the French left deliberately utilized theater as part of its community building enterprise during the Third Republic, which was the, the, the Republic in France from 1870 through 1940. Um, so it only follows that the Arbeit de Stimme would try to direct their readers towards what they thought produced good French language theater during the 1920s. In a late 1920s column in, uh, uh, titled The Theaters and Concerts We Visit, the newspaper wrote, naturally you can find some very nice theaters in Paris. The greatest number of them produce shunt, and we will not visit them. We will make efforts to inform our readers, of, readers about good theaters. The French theater has great meaning for Yiddish immigrant workers. With a firmly established group of immigrants in France, one finds a great need for the French theater, both as a place to, place to learn French and as a place to learn French culture. It is also a place for artistic reflection. Paris produced two great theaters which have lasted through many regimes, the Comédie Française and the Odéon. Armette Stimmer is quick to note the quality of the work the column juxtaposes two seemingly independent components of cultural life in Paris, long-standing French theater and the relatively new Yiddish theater, which is implied by the reference to Schund, or lowbrow theater, as I was saying. Although Schund here does not refer only to Yiddish theater, it is an evaluation indeed of some actual French theaters. The significant li significance, li significance lies <laughs> in how the two cultural components are woven together. Right? So one could enjoy French language theater at a low cost, but there was also a pedagogical component. Going to see French language theater was a way for Yiddish-speaking uh, Yiddish immigrants uh, to learn French. Uh, by visiting these carefully selected theaters, Jewish immigrants could learn French and French culture. Also, by placing this discussion of the French theaters within a column that condemned, or commented, excuse me, on Yiddish theater, Arba de Stimmer made an equation of quality or at the very least, a claim that the two have the potential to produce quality theater, French and Yiddish theater. The French theater was also a place where Yiddish-speaking immigrants involved in Yiddish theater could reflect upon, gain inspiration for, and ponder their own artistic voice, practice, and place within the French cultural milieu. Quite frankly, however, Yiddish theater in Paris was still in its infancy, or maybe more like its awkward teen years. Moshe Bernstein's the, theater, uh, the Temple Theater, a Yiddish people's theater founded in 1925, marked the emergence of a formidable cultural community, which he augmented through the launch of a periodical on Parisian Yiddish theater in 1927. Sadly, I've actually never found copies of this journal, so I have no idea what it covered, but I have found evidence that he did actually write a theater journal in, in Yiddish in Paris in the late 1920s. With this theater, Bernstein brought actors from across the Yiddish-speaking world to perform, including Berta and Rudolf Zaslavska, who were two actors from Vilna who were quite well known prior to World War II. Ariza Heint, the, the interwar Parisian outpost of the Warsaw-based Heint, the Yiddish uh, daily newspaper, called Rudolf a highly praised actor of Yiddish theater, and Berta, a famous actor and brilliant musician. This account couples international talent with a producer of Parisian Yiddish theater, Moisha Bernstein. Together, the columns connect international Yiddish theater talent and Paris's upstart Yiddish theaters. First, Paris served as a locale that simply hosted outside talent, like we're looking at in this poster right here. Soon thereafter, Paris became intimately linked to the larger Yiddish theater world by becoming a center that now helped to stage that talent. During the 1920s, though, coverage of Yiddish theater in Paris varied. In June 1927, for example, Baruch Vinagora, a, a culture reporter for Arbeiter Stimmer, was demissive of Yiddish theater in Paris, saying, the present day Yiddish theater in Paris knows only a wild outburst of primitive urges and terrible ignorance. It does not show any responsibility or demonstrate Jewish values, neither towards the Yiddish speaking audience nor towards Yiddish art which here has been turned into sacrilege. This tirade, however, seems to have been grounded in battles over Schoen versus art theater that we've talked about, a battle that certainly existed 
among some culture, cultural activists. But within the larger context of Yiddish theater in the war Paris, fewer of the artistic antagonisms appear within the newspaper's reports. Once Naya Pressa became the communist daily Yiddish language newspaper in January 1934, the focus on Shun diminished further because fanning the flames of these debates was a detriment to the larger Yiddishist and diaspora nationalist community building initiatives of 1930s Yiddish Paris. And just as a side note here, I should say, in the 1930s, these two terms, Yiddishism and diaspora nationalism, are fundamental to how these Yiddish-speaking uh, Jews are really imagining their place within French society. They're advocating for uh, cultural autonomy, so a diaspora nationalist kind of sensibility, um, but they're not asking for this to be done in the French language. They're asking for this to be done in Yiddish, so it's Yiddishist in that sense. However, and maybe we could talk about this in the Q&A, this is an attempt to create a Yiddish form of Frenchness. I actually call it um, uh, um, uh, Franco-Yiddishness. Surely lowbrow popular theater continued in interwar Paris, but this would be the last gasp of this Schund versus art theater debates, giving way to a theater scene more accepting of a wide variety of 1930s Yiddish theatrical productions. This would become key too once the People's Movement Theater, a French theatrical movement initiated in 1903 by Romain Roland, would be revitalized during the Popular Front years, 1936 to 1938. By the 1930s, the Yiddish press began to highlight changes within the Parisian Yiddish theater world to emphasize the further modernization and professionalization of the Yiddish theater scene in Paris. The play The Sinful Mother based on a popular novel by a well uh, unknown, well-known then, unknown now, uh, Parisian Yiddish writer Nissan Frank opened in Paris in January 1931. In addition to being a popular Yiddish fiction writer in interwar Paris, Frank was a cultural writer for two Parisian Yiddish newspapers, as well as a translator from French into Yiddish of Emile Zola. The performance was noted for its romantic depiction of the Rue de Rosier, the heart of the Jewish quarter, as the reports called it located in the, Jew, uh, the Jewish neighborhood, uh, or one of really the many Jewish neighborhoods of this period in, in, in Parisian uh, Jewish history, the Marais. The Rue de Rosier was the idealized centerpiece of the Plateau, a little square. And Parisa Hite notes that the scenes in the play paint a picture of Rue de Rosier that, makes, that represent a, represents a mix of old Jewish Paris, the actual Rue de Rosier, and the new, the young theater groups who were using Rue de Rosier to conjure nostalgia in their modern stage productions. Quote, a Jewish artist sets up his easel in the very heart of the Jewish quarter and makes sketches of the most famous street in Paris, noted Paris Heinz. It was simply the young Jewish set painter Bloom who had drawn La Rue de Rosier, end quote. Here, several layers of Jewish Paris, both immigrant and so-called native, are revealed. First of all, calling Rue de Rosier the most famous street in Paris is a clear reference to immigrant Jewish sensibilities. There, there are other streets in Paris that I would argue are more famous. I'll just, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> but Rue de Rosier does run through the heart of the Plaza, also, or the main historic Jewish quarter of Paris. Also highlighting the character Bloom, would have resonated with readers familiar with the French Jewish politician, socialist French Jewish politician, Leon Blum, who at that time in 1931 was the leader of the French Socialist Party and the editor of the, news, the party's newspaper, Le Populaire. The real turning point for Parisian Yiddish theater, however, was when the Culture League at Paris, or the Culture League Paris, a Yiddish cultural institution, uh, opened in Paris in 1922. This is when they started their drama circle. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, the drama circle would perform regularly at Culture League events and began to develop a small name for itself. Other cultural institutions in Paris, too, most notably the Maidem Club, who's the Boone's uh, cultural organization, and the Arbeiterheim, which was run by the Left Coalition, also started uh, drama circles during this period in Paris. It seemed as if Parisian Yiddish theater was begin beginning to gain traction towards being a viable and important cultural part of Yiddish Paris. Then in the early 1930s, Yiddish Paris scored its biggest coup, which happened in two parts. First, members of the Vilna troupe, most notably the director David Licht and the, another director, Jakob uh, Rothbaum, 
moved to Paris in 1933. Then in 1934, the communists were finally able to establish a, a stable daily newspaper outlet, the Naya Pressa. I had mentioned another communist newspaper earlier. That was one of many that existed that would pop up for a year or two here and there, starting in the mid-1920s. It's not until 1934 that, um, th that this newspaper, which winds up being a very, very important newspaper, actually runs until, uh, until the 1980s, um, uh, would emerge. And the Naya Pressa would, along with the Zionist Paris Zahain, which I mentioned before, establish the column space necessary to make theater reach far beyond the stage. So the reason I make so much uh, of these newspapers is because they allow people to read reviews and, and, and experience uh, Yiddish theater beyond just the uh, theaters themselves. The first significant piece on Yiddish theater in Naya Pressa ran on January 5th, 1934, four days after the newspaper made its debut. And the article, The Yiddish Workers Theater in Paris, was based on an interview with the artistic director of the Culture League's drama circle. The interviewer posed the question, what is the role of theater? And one of the interviewees answered, the role of theater as an educational and cultural tool is of great importance. The creativity, the creativity of the workers' theater in Paris will fill a large gap. Theater studies develops actors and complements workers' professional training. The interviewer then moved from questions about function to those of form, and the group responded, realistic forms will transmit contemporaneous content, pieces with social and revolutionary content, but, but not scenes of fake life and photographic reproductions. They will be synthetic and scenic paintings. For example, when it comes to dramatizing a novel, it is the quintessence that you extract, the fable, the action, and characters must be compressed and condensed." Unquote. A follow-up article with a few words about workers' theater covered David Lick's reading of Dovid Bergelson's Midas Hadin, or, or Judgment, which was written in 1929, which is a an odd story about a Communist Party official who, although depicted as a decent person, has absolutely no problem ordering murders. In the performance, Licht comes out on stage, but does not say anything. His associate Jakob Korlander st stood with him and gave a short overview of Bergelson and his work, who was a very, very well-known, very famous Yiddish writer at that time. Still is today, and something not alive anymore, uh, but uh, he's still well-known and, and, and celebrated uh, today. Then Licht, be Licht began to read. He was accompanied by 12 tableaus, and he was quick and lively, and he performed each of the characters. And Naya Pressa said that Schund and Schmaltz, and here literally rendered chicken fat, uh, but also used to describe a, a, a performance that was sentimental or sappy, were not present during the evening's performance. Representations of nearly all related organizations were there, and that workers' theater would be put to the test. And Naya Pressa called the workers' theater a real accomplishment. The real accomplishment in the development of Parisian Yiddish theater, however, was the formation of the Parisian Yiddish Workers' Theater, later the Parisian Yiddish Avant-Garde Theater, best known by the Yiddish acronym PIAT, that is a Yiddish Avant-Garde Theater. Uh-oh, trying to advance the slide here, let's see. Here we go, all right. Um, Formed from the Culture, League, uh, the Culture League's drama circle and catalyzed by the injection of Vilna Troop talent, Piat was interwar Paris's longest running homegrown Yiddish theater troupe. Between 1934 and 1940, Piat staged 27 plays, eight of them in 1938 alone. Approximately 250 people participated in the theater group, and Piat comprised working men and working women. Most, of, most if not all, of these actors worked during the day and rehearsed during the evening. And rehearsal sometimes was four times a week and it would start at nine o'clock in the evening. For most, theater was a means for their national but not economic livelihood. Placed within a French theater world that welcomed the modernism and the avant-garde, Piat transplanted the Vilna Troupe's transnational and Eastern European art theater to Western Europe. And it was a good fit. Paris's progenitor of theat theatric modernism therefore welcomed the, theater, the Vilna troupe as a progenitor of Yiddish modernism. Piat coupled the Jewish avant-garde theatrical educational model focused on rectifying the lacuna between Jews' knowledge of Yiddish theater and theater with that of French modernist theater that tried to shape, quote unquote, active citizens of the Third Republic. 
Playing to Piat's strengths, Paris gave Yiddish theater a home where it could sit at the heart of the Yiddish-speaking Jewish diaspora nation in France. Piat fundamentally changed the nature of Yiddish culture into war Paris because it established the base from which Yiddish cultural activists could engage both Yiddish and non-Yiddish speakers, as well as provide a regular Paris-based option for live theater performances and experiences. Piat provided an immigrant point of inquiry through which people in Paris could explore cultural pluralism promulgated by the larger avant-garde movement in France and rethink who had access to and ought to be included in popular culture. In 1935, Piat staged Shalom Aleichem's four-act comedy, The Gold Grabber, The Gold Diggers, a play about an orphan protagonist Benny's return to Eastern Europe from the United States as a self-made man. Benny is, for all intents and purposes, an American Jew who com comes back to the shtetl only to be confronted by those who remaining in living in economic depression, hoping that a treasure would save them. The Gold Diggers is a classic mesquilic, or play having to do with the J Jewish Enlightenment, a mesquilic play, in the sense that the shtetl is described as an unhealthy society, as well as a world of lies and corruption. The entire play is based on the ambig ambiguity of the symbol of the treasure, right? Falling as it does between the mythical hoard and the American material paradise between to be, and to have, between time and space. This ambiguity, which is expressed in the clash between generations, countries, and mentalities, is never resolved. It is within this ambiguity that Piat positions itself. It also captures what Shalom Aleichem, and through extension, classic Yiddish plays, meant for the group. Piat carefully constructed an ideal for itself. By reading marketing materials such as playbills and posters, it becomes clear that what was produced for viewers off stage was just as important as what was on stage. On the back of a playbill for um, uh, the gold diggers, Piat poses and responds to its own question, what does Shalom Aleichem mean to Piat? According to the playbill, Piat is a young theater collective in two ways. Time, Piat has been a theater group for only one year. And socially, Piat is still becoming a political theater, but is conflicted between theatrical heritage and the search for a realistically revolutionary repertoire. That alliteration is in the translation. I did not do that. So here we see the difficulties in trying to build an immigrant Jewish theater culture within, interwar, within the interwar French theater scene. Piat strove to be a political theater. But the politics were not declared, although Piat did tend leftist, uh, socialist, communist, uh, and Bundist as well. These were the political affiliations of those who were involved in the theater troupe. So it only followed that Piat felt comfortable in presenting its own take on what could be considered art and revolutionary theater. Addition additionally, a realistically revolutionary repertoire reveals a particularly French ideal of both the left and revolution, following in line with the political theology of Jean Jaurès and his political protege, Léon Blum. According to, jo, uh, to Jaurès, who famously said, Marx was wrong. The Republic is the political form of socialism. So support for the, for the Republic, for this, for this theater troupe, becomes very, very important, especially in the mid-1930s with the rise of fascism uh, in, in around uh, Europe and the world. The Playbill also discusses Piat's place within the French theater world and gives commentary on how to to defend the masses against the influences of Shund theater. Performing Shalom Aleichem's The Gold Diggers enabled Pat to, uh, Piat excuse me, to engage the Jewish masses and lay the groundwork for a permanent Yiddish theater in Paris. For Piat, performing classics, classic writers like Shalom Aleichem played a variety of roles, produced, producing plays, especially those with particular social, uh, social commentary, allowed them to tie themselves to quote unquote good theater. They also simultaneously claimed ownership in Paris as the arbiters of theater that focused on social commentary, which was all done with an artistic framework that brought the Jewish masses to the theater. So, um, oops, where are I? Okay, so uh, I wanna talk now a little bit about um, this playbill to kind of get a sense of how we can think about what this theater uh, troupe is doing and how they're presenting themselves and how they're thinking themselves as artists, right? So who was going to these shows? Um, we can take a look at this playbill. This was a playbill that was handed out 
for the 1938 production of um, The Bread Mill, um, which was a piece uh, written uh, for the stage by David Bergelson, written on a, a previous short story of his. And we have on the right hand side, uh, the Yiddish, and this is basically the, the, um, the cast of characters, right? Um, it's a pretty much a direct um, a translation or uh, of what's in the French. There's one slight difference, which we don't have to go into, but there's a slight difference about uh, who adapted for the stage and, uh, and some minor details that only Yiddish um, speakers would have known about. But then in the middle, we see uh, uh, um, uh, a synopsis, right? A plot synopsis. A description of what happens in each act. We can see the first act, the second act, and the third act. So people who were going would have been able to follow the story. So we have some sense that non-Yiddish speakers, perhaps even non-Jews, were going to the Yiddish theater in Paris. And we even know that there were indeed non-Jews going to, uh, non-Jewish, non-Yiddish speaking uh, French people going to the theater. In 1938, Magdalene Paz, a non-Jewish social activist and part-time theater critic for the French Socialist Party daily newspaper Le Populaire, wrote after attending a Piat performance, I do not understand a word of Yiddish, but I was struck, moved, interested, and charmed by this new piece presented by Piat. And to celebrate the close of that successful 1938 season, Piat invited fans, in true French fashion, to join them for a glass of wine to toast the season's success. Attendance was up, the repertoire was expanding, and they were gaining fame with an ever-growing number of Yiddish and French language, Jewish and non-Jewish news outlets. Piat also had put Yiddish art workers and minority avant-garde theater in France on the map in Paris. And people from both the Yiddish and French art world praised Piat. Piat members would continue work into the first months of World War II in France, even as the right light, light regulations on the air raids blackout uh, in Paris were, were going on. And productions continued until the largest part of the male personnel was mobilized into the army. Many of the theater uh, actors would survive the war. Um, they would either go in hiding uh, or they were in the resistance. Some survived in, in, in camps, um, but they would also come back and have a um, performance in July of 1945 to celebrate their 10 year anniversary. Many actors after this performance, some would stay in Paris, some would go to Argentina, some would go to New York. And you can actually see here um, in, the, in the playbill, you can see someone with the last name Lensky. Uh, that is an actor, uh, Leb Lensky, who was a member of Piat after the war. He stays in Paris for a couple of years and he goes to the United States. And he actually has a bit speaking part in the 1990s film, The Silence of the Lambs. Um, so, we can now tie Yiddish theater to Hannibal Lecter in wonderful, wonderful ways. I knew that's why you signed in this evening. We, we needed to make that connection. Um, and it's stories like this that are told in the Digital Yiddish Theater Project. Um, just to give a little background about the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, and then we're going to actually look at the website and kind of poke around a little bit, look at some of the projects. The DYTP, as we call it, Digital Leaders Theater Project, was established in 2012, excuse me, when Deborah Kaplan, I mentioned her earlier, um, I was talking about the Vilna Troupe, and Joel Berkowitz assembled a team of scholars in order to harness digital tools and methods to study um, and preserve the legacy of the Yiddish stage. And we've actually done more than preserve the le legacy, as, we'll, as I'll show you, we're actually also hoping and, and trying to help uh, get the word out of actual contemporaneous Yiddish theater productions that are happening now. Participants uh, are from the United States, uh, Canada, Europe, and Israel, and they include scholars, archivists, and librarians. There's kind of like a core members, member, group of members, if you will, contributors. Um, and the, the Digital Yiddish Theater Project was formed in recognition of the remarkable ability of digital humanities tools and methods to address the Yiddish theater's linguistic cultural and geographic complexity. I mean, just in, in the talk today, we, we heard about Goldfaden going from Romania and he spent some time in Paris. We have Vilna troop people coming from Eastern Europe and settling in, in Paris and, and these troops kind of traveling around and people being in contact. We have uh, theater actors from London coming into France, all this. And this is not just happening in France. This kind of geographic migration of, of the, theatrical uh, talent is, um, is, is, is really kind of part of the art form. And we thought that the deal is, the, Digital uh, tools might be a way to kind of even capture and visualize some of that. Uh, Deborah Kaplan does some really, really wonderful work 
with uh, digital visualizations to show kind of she works specifically on the Vilnitrum to how, how we can make connections among people and really show um, how complex some of that really is. Um, so I'm gonna escape out here of the, um, of the presentation and let's see if I can seamlessly um, get to the website. We're going to be able to do this. Uh, Avi, can you see the website right now or no? I Oops. don't see the website. No. Okay. Oops. I had it. I was, I was. There it is. Now we see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the home page. Uh, the website is uh, yiddishstage.org. And it's really three parts together. Um, its most active part is a blog. Uh, we have, I, I should know the number, but I've lost count how many blog posts we have published uh, over the several years. We aim to do about two posts a month, uh, and they range in uh, content and approach and who writes them. Uh, our most recent one came up, uh, just posted a couple of weeks ago on July 2nd. Uh, it's an interview with somebody who did a documentary about uh, Miss Yiddish um, uh, troubadour and, and cultural maker from Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires uh, named Evil Katz. Um, but as we can scroll down, you can actually kind of see recent posts. Um, we've actually been doing a lot on Buenos Aires. We've been having a lot of people kind of pitch ideas to us, and we think it's an exciting kind of way to tie in the history of Yiddish theater in Argentina to a more kind of global uh, audience and understanding. But you can kind of uh, scroll through and see some of these posts that we have um, done. Uh, this one right here, this, this image right here is from the uh, 1945, July 1945 Piat performance that I mentioned uh, during the talk. Um, but to give a sense of the types of blog posts that are coming out, um, we recently did uh, um, a highlight of a new play by uh, Rojo Kafritsen, who uh, wrote a, a, a play uh, called uh, Sturmer Shabbos um, that was supposed to be read um, right uh, after the um, kind of pandemic took hold here in the United States and lockdown quarantine started in New York and other places, uh, has not uh, done a public reading to my knowledge. Um, we have uh, here a uh, actual translation, um, which was one of the first We've done a few translations, but this is the first of an actual kind of um, theater script that uh, someone found and presented to us as wanting to uh, do a translation of. Uh, we've done uh, interviews, like I mentioned, with uh, Paula Vogel, who wrote the play uh, Indecent. Uh, and we've done also some more kind of crowdsourcing types of plays where people might find a, a, a series of, of postcards. We also have one, this is about postcards from Krakow. Um, we have another one that someone found uh, po uh, postcards of a Yiddish theater from Cairo from the 19 teens, uh, kind of wrote a post to try and really see if some of these tools could really uh, get out there to people that might have some information on some of these topics uh, in hopes to really kind of further not just our understanding, but some of these people's um, actual um, scholarship. Um, oops, this is the link to sign into this uh, call right here. Oh, there's another one. Uh, oops. All right. So, um, so that's the blog, and that is the most active kind of part of the Digital Yiddish Theater Project. I also want to show two of our projects, and this is kind of where we start to really engage some of what is um, capable within the digital humanities. Um, the first was the first project that we did. Uh, over the 20th century, there was uh, six volumes of an encyclopedia of Yiddish theater that was published by its editor, Zalman Sel uh, Zilber Zilberzweig. Um, the seventh volume was almost finished when he died. It was sat in galleys. Uh, it was ready to go to press. Uh, we wound up getting the, the rights to publish it on our website. So we had it scanned and digitized. And you can actually now search this, uh, this volume of the um, encyclopedia. The other encyclopedias have been digitized by the Yiddish Book Center, so you can download them. Um, but this uh, is, um, uh, was the first digital project of ours. Um, you can actually browse it by people. Um, there's, this is a unique encyclopedia, too, because within this volume, unlike some of the other volumes, there's actually a long history that Zilberstein wrote about the history of art theater. Um, so that's actually unique to this, and that's in here as well. 
but we have the, um, the, the pieces here are kind of isolated by the actor themselves. If you click in uh, into them, you we haven't uh, translated them yet, but that's hopefully it's a, a project that I would like to um, see come to fruition, but it's a, 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 an in, enormously immense uh, volume, so it would take time and money to do it. But we tried to extract as much of the metadata as we could from these entries so we get a sense of what role they played, when they when they were born. Some of the entries actually lift, list um, place of birth uh, and date and place of death. We've tried to capture that information as well. Um, uh, and in an attempt to really kind of bring this volume to um, people who are interested and scholars. Um, and then the new project that we are starting, which is a very exciting, I think, for not just scholars, but I think anyone interested in the history of Yiddish theater is a project that, we're that we call Plotting Yiddish Drama. Um, and it is really just, uh, we have just over 50 published so far, and we are hoping to get to 150 in the next year or two. Um, this is a resource that we basically have um, a sub plot synopses of, of Yiddish plays as we kind of uh, solicit them, get them. A lot of them come from uh, the notes of actual people who are part of the Digital Yiddish Theater Project. And this is really an attempt to kind of just bring some of these uh, synopses to people who might not have known what maybe even just the Dybbuk is about. Um, or um, any one of these plays here, we'll click through one just so you can get a sense of what's in it. Here we'll do a, a Sholem Ash play. Um, the Sinner, we have it also in the original, the, the title in the Yiddish, uh, and also the English translation. And we have the synopses here, this type of structure. And to the best of our ability, we put when the, when the um, play was published, so oftentimes in the early 20th century, some of these plays were actually just published that you could just purchase, and when we know the first performance uh, to be. Um, so this is just some of the information that you can get. And these are all, we're trying to tie everything together, right? So if there's a blog post that might mention Shola Mash or specifically even the Sinner, we will link you to this entry so that you can actually read the synopses too if you want. Um, I'm mindful of the time here, uh, everyone, and hopefully there's some questions. So we can end the conversation formally here, but hopefully we'll have a, a little bit more of a discussion afterwards. And um, I'd love to hear uh, some thoughts. Um, and now I'm going to see if I can successfully unshare so that I can see questions and, and everything. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, Nick, for really an, an excellent presentation and a, uh, also sort of a detailed introduction to the world of, of Yiddish theater in Paris, which I'm sure most of us uh, don't know much about. So um, I, I'm going to start as I see questions starting to come in. I'm going to start with, uh, with a question or two, and then I'll, I'll pivot to the questions that are coming in in the, in the chat. Um, on, the, on the website, um, I noticed, and if you want, you can go back to the website, you had a, the sort of major themes of Yiddish plays subdivided. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could explain to us a little bit about what were the major themes that sort of concerned uh, the Yiddish stage that, um, that you were able to subdivide? Like, what were the topics that Yiddish plays seemed to go back to over and over again? So the... Um, the... <laughs> The topic, the original topic list, um, startled our web designer. Um, I think we had upwards of twenty kind of uh, themes and topics that we wanted things to kind of be isolated as. We narrowed the, them down. Um, maybe should I share? A, do you, um, Avi? Do you want me to look specifically at one of the uh, the plot synopses? Is that what you're referring to specifically? The themes kind of play come up in both uh, all aspects of the website. Sure. So just tell us about sort of what were the major themes that, um, you know, you, you, you chose to subdivide the site according to. Yeah. Yeah. So we found themes that were reoccurring in a lot of the plays that we were thinking about and talking about. <clears throat> lots of questions about modernization, lots of questions about religion, uh, politics, um, even Jewish history itself. There's a, there's a play that's in our plot synopses um, that is about Shabbat Tzvi. Um, so these are themes that we noticed uh, in kind of our own uh, research on, on, on the history of Yiddish theater that were popping up. Um, and it's like I said before in the, in the introductory piece. I mean, these were themes that 
it's not just Yiddish playwrights that we're grappling with, right? I mean, these are these are themes, these are topics that people who were thinking about and writing um, Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish literature, not only in Yiddish, were really kind of grappling with. But there's a lot of um, uh, um, uh, uh, new versus old, kind of the old uh, plays about that um, mythologize or lambast the shtetl, again, kind of um, secular versus religious themes are, 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 are popular in a lot of the theater um, um, uh, productions that we've highlighted. Um, we had to try and narrow it down just for kind of searchability. And like I said, our original web designer did not want us to have as many themes and topics as we wanted to isolate, which we trusted them because we're not designers. So uh, <laughs> we were like, all right, you tell us. Um, but those were the major ones. Um, violence is a major issue that comes up in a lot of Yiddish theater, especially theater that starts to kind of pop up around the turn of the century. Um, we might think that uh, perhaps obviously in the post-war years, violence uh, is one that uh, is introduced into Yiddish theater. But really, um, with the pogroms that start as early as the 1800, uh, 1880s in Eastern Europe, those are ideas, those are themes that start to be introduced into, into Yiddish theater very early on. Um, that was another um, a major thing that we noticed and, and we felt um, was general enough to really kind of capture um, more than uh, several plays, right? That's the other trick about some of these, when you're mining, when you're trying to create tags as um, some digital humanities people call them, when you're trying to create some of these tags, you want to try and capture, you want to try and create them in a way that they will capture a lot of data, right? Because at the end of the day, a lot of these digital humanities projects, we're looking for something that down the road we can export as a data set of some sort so that someone can kind of mine those, right? So like we could say we have 150 plays at some, you know, hopefully in the future we will, when we'll get there, plays and plotting Yiddish drama. Um, 20 of them deal with issues of politics and violence and 25 deal with these types of themes. So those are some of the major themes. And that was also the thought process and kind of instead of trying to capture every single theme, every single type of um, uh, character that comes into a play, these more general uh, ones so that we can actually hopefully uh, create some sort of data set for someone who might be interested in something like that. Great, great, thank you. So I see a couple of questions have started to come in. So I'll, I'll ask the questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, okay. One one is a very a specific question that's asking about the current world of Yiddish theater. Um, and I'm going to expand it a little bit because uh, it's it's both looking at the Yiddish theater post COVID-19. You know, is, yeah. do you know of any projects that are going on right now? I mean, there's actually a, a sort of a, a history of Yiddish plays that, that deal with um, responses to plagues. And I could see that as being something that's drawn upon about the Yiddish theatrical response to plagues. Uh, if you know of any projects that um, that are um, developing, I, and, I, oh, sorry. No, I see. So I'm getting some echo. Okay, somebody's unmuted. Um, but but then the uh, the other question is, um, uh, you know, about uh, you know Yiddish, where what what is the world of the current Yiddish theater looking like? Um, if you can tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So the uh, so first of all, like. I probably should know, but I actually don't currently know of any, I'm sure that there are, um, but I have not seen, at least brought to my attention yet, uh, any um, Yiddish theater productions that are kind of taking place like maybe on uh, uh, WebEx or Zoom or um, Teams or whatever system people are using. I'm sure that there are. I know that there are chorus movements that are happening right now that are using the same technology. So I don't see why um, someone might not um, be thinking about staging something um, in this virtual world. I just can't think of any one specifically right now, but I would, I would find it hard to believe um, that it's not already out there. I'm sure someone uh, has already been working on it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the contemporary Yiddish theater scene, it's something that we try to kind of document with the blog. We do actually interviews with um, directors and writers who are producing uh, Yiddish theater now. Um, we've tended to focus uh, primarily on New York. Uh, there is a, a still a, a thriving um, Yiddish theater scene there, the Volksbühne, of course, um, with the recent, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, Fiddler Afendach or the Fiddler in the uh, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Um, 
which was a huge hit. And we did, we actually did a series of posts on Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Um, and they continue to do Yiddish language plays. Um, there are wonderful actors in New York who are performing in Yiddish. There's a lively, lively scene uh, in New York City still. Um, and other parts of the world too, right? Um, in Eastern Europe, there is some Yiddish theater uh, currently um, that is being produced, especially during the times when uh, some of the uh, Yiddish uh, cultural festivals happen. Uh, there is an annual Sholem Ash festival in Europe uh, where they do, uh, I think that they've done some readings at least of, of Ash's uh, Yiddish plays in the past. Um, like I mentioned before, even some of the older kind of classic plays are being um, restaged in, not in translation, but in Yiddish. Also, I mentioned before the Sholemash um, God of Vengeance was staged um, not too long ago. Um, there was a Yiddish translation of Death of a Salesman uh, that uh, staged in New York and Paris, um, which came in the wake of, there was a scholar who um, uh, did this very Jewish reading on, on Godot and saying that, the, that you were waiting for Godot and there's this particular moment it was supposed to be. It was um. It's supposed to be someone to help this person kind of emigrate, and he never came. Um, so it was this very kind of like uh, Jewish reading on death of a salesman. So it was translated into French. I mean, excuse me, Yiddish. Um, and uh, there's also an active troupe. You have to. I apologize, but if you invite me to speak, I will talk about France. I, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a fault of mine. Um, but there's an actual troupe uh, still working in Paris right now, the Troyem Theater. There's some others too in uh, in Western Europe uh, that are staging uh, Yiddish theater now. I actually, a, a friend of mine who is uh, one of the people in the Troyem Theater told me, I think that he told me that there was um, uh, a, a troupe in Stockholm, if I'm not mistaken. So it's all over. Uh, people are engaging and rediscovering this as an art mode uh, and really trying to do something new with it. And even, like I said, revitalize some of the classics and, and try to kind of give a, a new staging to it, bring them to new audiences. But yeah, there's a, a pretty lively um, scene. Um, of course, it's not the 1920s, it's not the 1930s, um, but still there are people producing and, and doing really exciting things. Great, okay, so we have another question here that um, asks about music. Um, so it's, as Faye Ringel writes, and music was intrinsic to Yiddish theater, not only in operettas, but in musicals, but in what is built, sorry, let me just mute someone, um, but, uh, but in what is built as drama. Um, so the, the question is, can you talk a little bit about sort of the central role that music plays in, in both the Yiddish theater and in um, opera and, and in musicals? Sure. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, music um was and is just like theater right i mean music is a ma major part of theater history period uh and as i mentioned you know a lot of the a lot of the historical trends in yiddish theater really kind of paralleled what was happening in global and world theater and so as a result yes absolutely music is a, is a intrinsic part of um yiddish theater not just in operettas and not just in operas but also just in in staged uh drama um, as well, my own particular research, the troops that the troops that I researched myself did not use much music, um, and I've always suspected that was because of finances, uh, and that they really had difficulties kind of staging their plays. So, kind of adding this new element um, would have been, I think, financially difficult for them. Um, but, for, but absolutely, um, you know, music is was is uh, a, an absolute fundamental component of Yiddish theater. And I think the reason for it has as much to do with entertainment as I think that if we think of Yiddish theater, some people, I mean, right, in, in, in Yiddish, uh, the word bima, as we all know, or some people might know, is is the uh, the raised platform in the middle in the middle of a synagogue, in the middle of a shul, right, where the where the, the lectern and the, and the ark are. But it's also the word for stage. Um, so when you're in Yiddish theater, you're performing on a bima, right? So there's this kind of communal Yiddish, Jewish communal component to uh, Yiddish theater that I think that bringing and including and making music be a fundamental, fundamental component of that is only engaging in not just the art form, but I think really just kind of the history of, of, of Jewish culture. Um, so absolutely, it was a fundamental component of, of Yiddish theater. And played a very much a communal role in kind of engaging people in this uh, in this art form. Great. All right, I'm going to ask one one last question of my own, um, which is so your title of your book project is Yiddish Paris, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I sense that there's something provocative about that title, um, which I think is connected to your sort of broader project about the Yiddish theater um, in interwar France, because historically there was a tendency to see sort of France and French culture as this very powerful assimilating, you know, culture that took uh, new immigrants and quickly tried to turn them into Frenchmen or French women. Um, but in this case, it seems that you're arguing against that um, by talking about sort of Yiddish Paris um, yeah. as opposed to French Paris. And so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about um, what you think, uh, what, what the, the sort of broader point that you're trying to make about sort of the role that the Yiddish theater could play in creating sort of a diverse culture and a, what would be a French, a part of French culture. Sure. So, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the title is meant to kind of push against this notion that there is this overarching hegemonic French um, culture that one must assimilate to, to be a part of. And, and I think historically there is some truth to that, but there's also many moments in French history when people tried to push against that. And it's not just immigrants. Um, during the 1920s and the 1930s, um, the way that I think and the way that I argue that Yiddish theater had a fundamental component to, of, uh, was fundamental to this project of creating this kind of uh, culturally plural version of Frenchness that included space for Yiddish culture was because uh, when I, I mentioned the theater troupe and they changed their name to the avant-garde after one season. Um, they call themselves, the first year they're called the Yiddish, uh, the uh, uh, Parisian Yiddish Workers Theater and then after one season they changed it to the Parisian Yiddish avant-garde theater. And that's because in Paris in the 1930s, the avant-garde is actually pushing themselves for a cultural plural version of Frenchness, the French avant-garde is. So this was a moment in time when um, Paris was an immigrant city in the interwar years, right? I mean, there were millions of people from all over Europe, all over the colonial, um, um, colonial states of, of France. So this was a very cosmopolitan, perhaps the most cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan space in, in Western and perhaps even all of Europe. And this project by these Yiddish speaking Jews was not in isolation. Um, this was a moment too when people like Amy Cesar and others were really kind of developing ideas of negritude and ideas of black nationalism in Europe and especially in the colonies, in the French colonies. And this was a conversation that people were having. Um, so yes, this was very much an attempt to rethink Frenchness through this immigrant Yiddish um, lens and really kind of push the boundaries of the republic to see who could consider who could be considered french who could um be considered maybe um you one could be um a, a variety of nationalisms right maybe you could be civically french but you could be culturally or ethnically um yiddish or jewish and these were all uh, aspects that were being pushed to the fore in 1930s uh france and and Theater plays this mo theater is important here because, as I mentioned, it's a play people people go to the theater in languages that they don't understand, right? I mean, people go to the opera, and the opera could be in German or Italian, but you can still enjoy it. You can still be part of that experience, and I think theater has that power of creating community and kind of like really putting people side by side who might not have been side by side. Um, I see the Yiddish theater, especially in, in, in France, as this, this space where Zionists and Bundists and communists were all participating in the same cultural uh, phenomena. And, and then, like I mentioned with, with, uh, with the journalist Magdalene Paz, also non-Jews were, we know, were going to the Yiddish theater and, and engaging that. She was a social activist. She was a, uh, an activist for refugee rights, and that's why she was there, and that's why she's engaging the theater. But yeah, it has um, the argument that, I'm, that I make is that at this particular moment, there was this attempt to really kind of push the boundaries of Frenchness and try to include Yiddish culture as some part of French culture. Um, we we can discuss the successes or failures, but we have an, I, I, we probably all have a very good sense of the successes or failures there. Uh, but at least in that particular moment, this was something that people were trying to do. So yeah. Yeah, no, and it definitely points to the potentials for sort of what existed in interwar France um, it had things not gone differently. So, um, and and as I think you know, some of the comments which I've alluded to is there is a there is a space certainly in the American context for continuing popularity of 
Yiddish theater. Um, you can look at so someone wrote in about Fiddler on the Roof in, in Yiddish, um, or you know, Faye alludes to sort of the popularity of the jazz singer in the interwar period, which has very, very Jewish themes, but crosses over. Um, there, there, you know, is a lot of space for that. And and I, I want to applaud you and your colleagues for your work to sort of continue to create a space for Yiddish culture um, and the potentials of uh, of Yiddish theater and Yiddish culture in the American context as well, right? Sort of, sort of, uh, uh, you know, arguing for a diverse cultural expression um, that can be multilingual. So um, it's not either or, right? I mean, like. Um we all wear various hats. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a way to kind of like really, I think, put people in conversation with one another and look at an art form that forced people to do that, to think of other experiences, to think in different languages, to think about people speaking different languages, even Yiddish itself, to, 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 to think that there is one Yiddish is, that is not, Narishkeit, that's nonsense, right? I mean, like, there's a variety of the, the Yiddish speakers in, in France speak Yiddish very differently than they would have in, in Vilna or other places around the world. So, yes, to think of kind of like this, um, this very culturally plural um, uh, possibility, I think, is, is really, um, at least for me, one of the things that draws me to the history of Yiddish theater is, is something that I think really tells us a lot about the past. So now we're just going to wait for the uh, sort of next Broadway musical that fuses Yiddish and hip hop and rap and the history yes. of America. So that's what we all have to look forward to. That um, would be. Yeah. So, um, Who that want, be? <laughs> yeah, we just asked Lynn Manuel Miranda to write it. So, um, I want to thank you so much for really sharing your, your time and your expertise with us and contributing to our program on um, the Yiddish Welt and sort of continuing this legacy of, of Yiddish culture and, and bringing this to a much broader audience. So thank you so much, uh, Nick. Um, thank you. Our, our next uh, lecture in this series will take place in two weeks on July 27th. Uh, it was co-sponsored by the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford. Um, and we'll be hosting uh, Mark Sloben, who will be uh, uh, speaking on, um, on the Yiddish song. Uh, and uh, many of you know uh, Professor Emeritus from Wesleyan University. So we're very excited to have Professor Slobin speaking uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Wonderful to see you as well, Nick. And to everyone, sei gesund und stark, stay healthy, stay safe, and we will keep seeing you online. Be well. And I, thanks everyone for being here. This was a, a great pleasure. Thanks. Amechaye. <laughs>